Hey everyone, Rob Ryder, uh, December 19th, 2012. And uh, continuing on with uh, trying to put things into the civil side, into chancery, equity, whatever it might be called. And yesterday, Ro went with a friend who's in a foreclosure. And Ro lives in Illinois, and she had already put in a civil pleading into um, a non foreclosure case, just saying. They didn't sign the deed of trust, therefore we don't have a contract, send me back my securities, and I acknowledge the sales contract, known as the warranty deed, I wish to have it lawfully executed, show me as the owner. So that's what hers is, and then she put in a motion, because we hadn't added, we'd like a declaratory judgment, just based on the evidence provided, and uh, she has a hearing on the third. So, uh, so she wasn't quite done so she took a friend down to uh, this is Cook County this is uh, Sh Chicago right and so this is the uh, Chancery Division civil cover sheet general Chancery section right this is what you would use for a cover sheet to put on your pleading and uh, and they also did uh, the indigent paperwork down there it would have cost four hundred dollars to put this in ended up being free go figure and they put it down as uh, a declaratory judgment, 0002, by pro se. So that's what they use as the cover sheet. And since they were in the Chancery Division civil cover sheet in the general Chancery section, and we had discussed this earlier, said, you know, we don't see part of these cases that we're involved in. Um, let's ask Chancery for their side. And so she did. So the um, foreclosure that's going on that prompted her to go help her friend to put this um, civil action in is based on this. So what this is is what was in the chancery records for the foreclosure, 11 CH 29611, um, between the uh, PNC Bank National Association and uh, Brown. We'll just call him Brown. E T A L. That's why they put him down there. So you can see that this cover sheet isn't the same as this cover sheet, right? This is the general chancery section. General's always good. Generals are always at the top. And this is not a general. It's just the chancery division civil cover sheet. Interesting. So we're going to kind of go through this. I, I only got this today and I've looked at it a couple of times but not really studied it. So this time as I study I'm going to go through and just we're going to pick out things that we could use as a equitable defense or bring up as an equitable remedy whatever the case may be. So the first thing is it's an owner occupied single family home. Well they just said the guy in the house is the owner. Right? How can they be foreclosing on him? He's the owner. But they are. And uh, so there's the address. And uh, so the name. So this is who is, uh, you know, they're, they're really signing for the plaintiff, right? Pearson Associates. So the whole attorney firm just got involved. So that's the cover sheet. And then this was the, uh, right, th this is their caption page, right? This is what things look like in civil cases. Hey, they look like this. <clears throat> now, interesting, uh, PNC Bank National Association, it says, comma, National Association as successor and in interest to Mid-America Bank, comma, FSB. Well, who's the defendants? Brown is, and then PNC Bank comma, N-A, S-I-I, which should stand for successors and in interest, to Mid-America Bank, comma, F-S-B. Unknown owners and non-record claimants. So the complaint, you know, is against these people, yet the, the first page just shows it being against Brown. All right, and they don't have anybody's addresses on here or none of the other stuff, right? They're just names, right? But PNC Bank is suing PNC Bank, comma, comma, right? How can PNC Bank be the plaintiff and the defendant? Interesting. 
Complaint to foreclose mortgage. First complaint, plaintiff says, right? Plaintiff didn't swear. Plaintiff files this complaint to foreclose a mortgage, comma, trust deed or other conveyance in the nature of a mortgage, such as a deed of trust, here and after called a mortgage, um, here and after described pursuant to some law, okay? Uh, interesting. Attached as Exhibit A is a true copy of the mortgage. Attached as Exhibit B is a true copy of the note secured thereby. Now, we're always running out of time yesterday because you never have enough time to do this stuff. It, it took longer. When you do the indigent paperwork, you have to go get a judge to sign. They went to find the judge. It was around lunchtime. They must have been having a party because, you know, it took like two hours to get the judge. And when they found him, there was a table with a bunch of, you know, leftovers on it. So they must have been having a Christmas party or something. Who knows? Anyways, it ate up too much time. So she didn't, when they gave her this file, right, they just gave her the whole file. It had a copy of the mortgage in there. And she didn't have enough quarters and, you know, didn't have enough time to go get more quarters. So what she did is she made copies of everything but the mortgage. And apparently the note, because the note's not in here. But they were supposed to have been both attached, true copies, of the mortgage and the uh, attached Exhibit B is a true copy of the note secured thereby. Okay, so they're saying that the note is secured by the mortgage. Right, well, they took your note and they monetized it, converted it to legal tender, so it's no longer a note, so there was nothing wrong with your note, so there's really no reason to have a mortgage anymore. Your note was good. Right, you gave an IOU and you paid because they converted it to cash. <clears throat> and information concerning said mortgage, this says, uh, you know, it's called a mortgage, when it was recorded, name of mortgagors or grantors, he could be either or, it's just him. Name of mortgagee, trustee, or grantee is MidAmerica Bank. Well, they never signed the contract, so they couldn't have been a trustee or a grantee. They should be, but to be a grantee, you would have had to acknowledge the deed. To be a trustee, you would have had to acknowledge the deed. To be a mortgagee, guess what? You have to acknowledge a deed. They didn't acknowledge the deed of trust slash mortgage, therefore it's a unilateral contract. It's nothing more than an imperfect gift, but because they have it sitting in their drawer, it's seen as an equitable mortgage over the property listed on the mortgage. And what's listed on the mortgage? The title to the real property, the land, and the personal property, which was your note and all the payments you made. Uh, data recording, yada, yada, yada. Uh, interest subject to mortgage, fee simple, right? So we want to get it because when we get the mortgage, we have fee simple interest. <coughs> And they, okay, so that was put in on, this is uh, August 22nd. That's the day that went in, and this was August 22nd of uh, 2011. All right. And then, as you can see, this is an order, so this isn't the complaint. The complaint stopped right here. Nobody signed the complaint, nobody put it under penalty of perjury. Well, there's your first thing about a complaint is, uh, your answer to this complaint is, well, as soon as the plaintiff puts his complaint under oath, I'll consider answering it. They can't do it. But we don't want that. We're really trying to get our property back, right? But that's, you know, that's a stopgap. But as you can see, it was never signed. That I guess that's the point. At the same time, they wrote their own order of default. Now, when is this going in? Now, this is February 15th, right? So, this went in in August 2011. And then this was submitted in February 2012. Uh, looks like the same apparent plaintiff. And, again, PNC Bank and PNC Bank. All right, well, what this was was a order of default. This cause coming to be heard on plaintiff's motion for default and the court having found that the defendant have failed to appear and or plead, it is hereby ordered that the defendant, Brown, is, are in default. It is further ordered that unknown owners, 
non-record claimants are dismissed as party defendants. Well, how come they got dismissed? How come Brown didn't? Now, so what they did is they, you know, now, I don't think that Brown was ever served anything, right? He, When they put this complaint in, they should have made a service of some kind that the complaint had been entered. And uh, Roe was asking uh, Brown, who's, you know, he's not from America either, hard with English, but, you know, to go look at his record, see if he had, had ever seen something like this. But as they were looking at it at the table, he alluded to the fact that, you know, most of this paperwork he'd never seen before. So we don't know exactly what that is, but... Anyways, uh, in February, right, this was, again, this was written by the plaintiff or their attorney for an order saying, well, they never did answer, right? So now we'd like to have an order on the plaintiff's motion for default. And apparently this judge signed it. Although I don't know, it's supposed to go up here above enter, Right? What does enter mean? I'm not really sure. And, you know, is there supposed to be a date on here? Does that matter? Because there is a date here. You know, can, can you just put judge under your name? I don't think so, right? But, but it does have this stamp. So what value that is, is yet to be determined. But they put Brown into default. And this one was put in on the same date. And this was an order of summary judgment. Now, this is the interesting one. So, this cause coming to be heard on plaintiff's motion for a summary judgment against PNC Bank, comma, N.A., right? This bank right here. And the court finds that no material issue of fact has been raised. It is hereby ordered that summary judgment is granted in favor of the plaintiff against the defendant. So if this is the plaintiff, PNC Bank, right, they just got a summary judgment against themselves. Whatever that means. Okay, so what we have now is um, there's been a summary judgment against the bank. The unknown owners or non-recorded claimants have been dismissed and uh, Brone has been defaulted on because he didn't answer because he never got a summons now this is going on with Bob in Massachusetts right now also he went down to the the land court to get his records and he walked up the counter and said is this a place where attorneys would you know start a, a case for foreclosure well yes it is well I may have some foreclosures I'd like to have the records he showed him his ID, whatever it took, and the guy said, yeah, you got four of them. He said, four? I should only have three. So now there was one entered in September. So, long story short, back about in July, Bob put in a um, revocation of deed of trust. And that particular foreclosure, the attorney put in a voluntary dismissal. Yet in September, somebody else picked it up, even though it had been dismissed, and started a case, and to this day, being almost the end of December, Bob has not did not know boo about it. All right, because they never notice you. So they're not following procedures. <clears throat> so he'll have his copies tomorrow and we're gonna see what his say. So what what'd they do? Well, where was I? Okay, so we got an order of summary judgment against these guys. That was on the 15th, and then this was on the 15th also, order to appoint selling officer. This cause coming on to be heard on motion of plaintiff for entry of an order appointing a foreclosure sale officer. It is hereby ordered by the Intercounty Judicial Sales Corporation. It is hereby appointed selling officer for the purpose of the sale and public auction of the property subject to this action pursuant to the judgment of foreclosure and sale entered herein judgment of foreclosure and sale right so we got to find judgment of foreclosure and sale but again all, all of these things are being written by the plaintiff's attorney the judge is just sealing it right so they put in their own order and this is the 15th also so judgment for for, for sale for foreclosure and sale 
This cause coming to be heard upon plaintiff's motion. Okay, the court has jurisdiction over the parties, the subject matter, that all material allegations of the complaint and those deemed to be made pursuant to another law of the Illinois Code of Civil Procedure are true and proven, and this judgment is fully dispositive of the interest of all defendants. And that by virtue of the mortgage and the affidavits presented as evidence of indebtedness, there is due to the plaintiff, and it has a valid and subsisting lien on the property described below the following amounts. Well, first of all, where were the affidavits? Because there are no affidavits um, in here. So that would be one thing to be asking for. Where are these affidavits you talk about? But it has this amount here for 155000 All the foregoing amounts have been accounted for in the affidavit filed by the plaintiff. Where's the affidavits? Subpoena the affidavits. You, have, you must subpoena, right? Must subpoena. That gets the court involved. That's the court of chancery. They're the ones that came up with the subpoena. And that's how you get things, get testimony. Books, records somebody's uh, complaint under oath, whatever it is, you subpoena them. All the foregoing amounts have been accounted for in the affidavits filed by plaintiff. That there is due and owing to the following defendants the sum set that there is due and owing to the following defendants the sum set forth as a lien upon the subject premises subordinate and inferior to the lien and interest of the plaintiff pursuant to the response of pleadings documents filed herein forth as liens upon subject premises so that there is due and owing to the following defendants the sum set forth the sum set forth 155,000 as a lien upon subject premises so right that, that to me I'm saying that's the defendant's money but a subordinate and inferior to the lien and interest of the plaintiff pursuant to the response of pleadings documents filed herein. The court further finds that there is due and owing to the PNC National Association successor by merger to Mid-America Bank as a lien upon subject real estate which is subordinate and inferior to the lien and interest of the plaintiff herein of the plaintiff herein the sum of 124 so another hundred twenty four thousand dollars as of the 27th, 2001, plus interest and penalties pursuant to pleadings filed herein. Okay. By the terms of the subject mortgage, plaintiff is entitled to an award of reasonable attorney fees. So for doing all this work, the, the plaintiff is really entitled to uh, $1,450. That's all the plaintiff gets. Then under the provision of the mortgage, plaintiff is entitled to be reimbursed for the expenses incurred in this case. Okay, but again, they never signed the mortgage, right? So none of this really matters. There's no contract. They didn't sign the deed of trust. That advances include any advance made subsequent to the execution of the affidavit. So after the execution of the affidavits of mortgagee, I don't believe we've seen those yet. That's supposed to be the bank. Where's their affidavits? <clears throat> made to protect the lien of the plaintiff and preserve the real estate shall become additional indebtedness secured by judgment lien pursuant to something. But it depends on these affidavits of, mor of the mortgagee having been executed. Anybody seen them? Subpoena them. I want to subpoena Block E. I want to see the affidavits. <clears throat> that the mortgage described in the complaint is recorded in the office recorder. Okay, and that's where it is. Described as follows. And uh, I don't know this all. This here looks like it's a land um, description, all right? The south, so many feet. The east, so many feet. Of the west, so many feet. Of the northeast, of one quarter of the southeast, one quarter as measured on the north and south lines thereof of section twenty-seven township. This is a land recording, right? That's to me. That's a land description. I'm not an expert, but to me that looks like a land description. And commonly known as what we know in this tax ID, that's actually the parcel number is what Roe would tell me. That would be the parcel number to the property. 
that the subject mortgage secures a note executed on executed by or on behalf of Brown, right? That the subject mortgage mortgage secures a note. Okay, well Brown executed a note, he signed it, and then they went and converted it and turned it to cash, they've been paid. There's no reason to have a mortgage. A mortgage just there to, it is only there to secure the note. Well the note's been satisfied. It was turned to legal tender. That the mortgagors and any other owners or co-owners of the subject property, so the mortgagor is Brown, are the owners of the equity of redemption. Okay, they're, they're telling you right now you're, that Brown's the owner of the equity of redemption as set forth in complaint. That the rights and interests of all defendants in the subject property are inferior to the lien of the plaintiff, right? But not the mortgagor. They're the owners of the equity. Equity of redemption. Well, what was a redemption? I don't know what that means. Is, that, is this the redemption? Are they saying that Brown's the owner of 155000 plus this uh, 124000 As convoluted as it is, I'm going to say yes. The rights of reinstatement shall expire 90 days from the date the owners of equity of redemption were served with summons or by publication. Well, if you didn't get a summons sent to you, then they need to publish it. All right, that's what this is saying. So, unless they can show proper service that the, you, you got a summons or um, that it was put into the legal section of the paper and they got the affidavit back from uh, the publisher saying that it was published, well, then your rights haven't expired yet. The mortgage real estate is is not you know you think they had to pick one is it or is it not residential I'd be asking well is it or is it not you tell me you're the one bringing the claim provided the real estate is residential the redemption period shall expire no later than seven months from the date of the mortgage was served by summons or publication or three months from the entry of this judgment provided the real estate is not residential the redemption period shall expire six months from the date Okay, I don't know what that's all about. Three months from the date of the entry of this. Okay. The rights of a redemption shall expire on May 16th, unless shortened by further court order, except pursuant to 28 U.S.C. I didn't look this up, 2410. See what that says. If a defendant shall be granted 120 days from the date of sale, which to redeem the property from sale. So did your rights of redemption ever happen? It really depends on if they gave proper service. And then it doesn't really matter because they never signed the deed of trust. We just go back to the very simple thing. There's all these other things we could complain about. But you point out their error early and see their last, as Coke would say it. And so what you do is say, well, you didn't sign the freaking contract. If you're not going to sign the contract, then give me back my property. It is further ordered that the judgment is entered uh, pursuant to something in the court finds that due to it, there is due and owing to the plaintiff the sum set forth in paragraph A above. Okay, back up to A above. Uh, what? The attorney's fees? 1450 because down here it said that's what they were entitled. So. They're not saying this whole number. They're saying 1,450 of all of this is due to the attorneys. Okay, that a judicial sale of the subject property be conducted by a judge, sheriff, or foreclosure sales officer in accordance with statutory provisions. Notice of sale. The notice of sale shall be given pursuant to another law that said notice shall include the following information, but an immaterial error in the information shall not invalidate the legal effect of the notice. Name, address, telephone number of the person to contact for information, the common address and common description, other than legal description, if any, of the real estate. The legal description of the real estate is sufficient to identify it with reasonable certainty. <coughs> 
a description of improvements on the real estate. So these would all be things they'd have to publish in their publication. The time specified in this judgment, if any, when the real estate may be inspected prior to sale. The case title, case number in court in which the foreclosure was filed. No other information is required, but those things have to be in there. I think it said shall. Shall be given. Right? Not much room for error there. Th those things shall be given. It had better be in whatever they published. If not, they didn't follow the rules, right? They didn't follow their procedures. Ah, publish at least three consecutive calendar weeks, once in each week. The first such notice to be published no more than 45 days prior to the sale. And this goes into all the other stuff about it, which I haven't really gone through. But I guess the reason I'm showing you this is, right, that if you've not seen these kind of documents for, for whatever reason, I, I don't know. Maybe you have. Maybe if you go to the law side, you get this stuff in, a, in your file for foreclosure. If not, these were gotten by going to the equity side, the civil side, the chancery side, whatever it is, and really found by saying, you know, in Bob's case, is this where the attorneys put in their cases for foreclosure? Well, yes, it is. Well, I have some foreclosures. He's going to get his. Roe was here at this particular office putting in uh, uh, basically a, um, a civil complaint against this foreclosure. And so while she was there, she just asked, do you happen to have the copies of the foreclosure? Why, yes, we do. Here they are. Wasn't any hassle. Wasn't any gnashing of teeth. However, another Bob, lots of Bobs in this for some reason, in Pennsylvania, he had a heck of a time getting his in in Pennsylvania, Delaware County. Although he emailed me today that he finally did get it in. Uh, but they made it quite difficult, and uh, I haven't had a chance to look at what he sent me yet. But, you know, I, again, he's put one in for foreclosure, same type of thing, always the same thing, until we know better, until we actually have a hearing on this stuff, right? Based on the preponderance of the evidence that the lender has never signed the deed of trust, therefore, it's not a lawful obligation. They're, they're trying to enforce it as a false obligation. And we acknowledge the warranty deed, which is the sales contract between you and the grantor, and we're asking for a specific performance to have it lawfully executed and have the title deed put in your hand, which was what was supposed to happen. All that's happened and all this stuff is nobody's finishing the contract. Right? The closing agents didn't complete the contract. Well, they were supposed to. That's why they're closing agents. Right? They're supposed to be experts in their field, right? So if, if they didn't do it, 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 to me it's deceit. Satisfaction of claims in the order of priority adjudicated in this judgment of foreclosure, the order confirming and sale any other order of this court and Remittance of any surplus to be held by the officers conducting the sale subject to further order of the court. The determination of any in persona judgment is deferred until the confirmation of sale hearing except as to the defendant. They didn't put anybody in there. Whom personal deficiency is waived. So again, I don't know what all these little things are, but these are all the things they have to do. All right? So this is like boilerplate stuff. And, uh, you know, I'll stop here. If you want to actually read it, stop the screen. You can read it all you want. And I'll move on a little bit further. And you can read it to your leisure. And further, mm -hmm. that the court retains jurisdiction in the subject matter of this cause and all parties hereto for the purposes of enforcing this judgment. Excellent. The court retains jurisdiction. 
Well, this they're talking about the Court of Chancery retains jurisdiction. See, nobody ever signs for these attorneys, right? I don't know if this is even lawful, you know, at all. There's no freaking signature on them. <clears throat> Sign the damn papers. And then these were just, uh, I think, the receipts that were, like, on the back of subsequent pieces of paper. So this may have been on the back of the section we just looked at. Amount of original debt and indebtedness. Capacity in which the plaintiff brings this suit. Plaintiff is the holder of the mortgage and note. Excellent. The plaintiff has got the mortgage and the note. Then give me back my property. And this is the uh, legal description, commonly known as. We've seen that before. After all payments received have been applied, the mortgagors are now in default for the monthly payments for March through present balance due on the note. The balance due on the note. Well, there is no balance due on the note. Right? They already monetized it. And the mortgage is the total of the principal balance of plus interest, cost, fees, advanced to plaintiff. The current per diem interest rate is 22-23. Name of present owner. Again, they're, they're saying that Brown's the owner. Name of persons in addition to said owners, but excluding any non-record claimants defined uh, who are joined as defendants and whose interest in or lean on the mortgage of real estate is sought to be terminated. Oh, oh this, okay. I, I didn't see this before. Look at a different document number here. This isn't the same document number as uh, by virtue of a mortgage executed by Brown on recorded deeds office. Because his number is 051540504. That was up above, and I'd written it down. And then anyway, with this, this is a different number 0713136095. We, you know, you want to go get that document as document to secure a note in the principal sum of 121500 and said lien is inferior to that of the plaintiff therein. So there's another piece of paper someplace. Names of persons claim to be personally liable for deficiency unless personal liability is discharged in the bankruptcy in a bankruptcy proceeding or otherwise released. Okay, so they, they're claiming that Brown is personally liable for deficiencies unless personal liability is discharged in a bankruptcy proceeding or otherwise released. Plaintiff seeks to include in judgment the plaintiff's attorney's fees, costs, and expenses. Plaintiff alleges that in addition to persons designated by name herein and unknown defendants referred to above, that there are other persons and or non-record claimants who are interested in, in this action and who, who have a claim some right, title, interest, or lien to or on the real estate or some part thereof in this complaint described, including but not limited to the following unknown owners, recorded claimants, if any. That the name of each such person is unknown to the plaintiff and on diligent inquiry cannot be asserted and all such persons are therefore made party defendants to the action by the name and descriptions of unknown owners and non-record claimants. So that's how you could put people if you're doing your own uh, civil action. Don't know who they all are. Unknown owners or non-record claimants. I don't know who they are. Who's got my property and says they're the owner? That should a deficiency result from foreclosure sale of the subject property plaintiff may seek an impersonum or in rem deficiency judgment unless the defendants, which are liable to the subject mortgage note, have had personal liability of said note discharged in a bankruptcy proceeding or if said liability has been otherwise discharged or released. Well, they didn't sign the deed of trust, so I guess they're going to give me a release. 
that should the subject property be vacant, the plaintiff may seek to have the court find that the property is abandoned pursuant to... All right, so this is where they try to say you abandon the property by whatever means they're going to do that with. Uh, subject property uh, that the plaintiff may seek appointment of mortgagee in possession or appointment of receiver. That the may seek appointment of mortgagee in possession Okay, a mortgagee in possession. Well, Rome was a mortgagee. Well, actually, no, the mortgagee would be the bank. But the bank um, got a judgment against the bank. So, who knows what that means? Whereof the plaintiff requests a judgment of foreclosure and sale, judgment for attorney's fees, order approving. In personam, deficiency judgment if sought unless defendants have personal liability. Yeah, we already talked about that. In order, granting a shortened redemption period if sought. They're looking for all these things, and they ah, they finally signed something. Pearson Associates, attorneys for plaintiff. And there's their address. Okay, and then... Uh, October 3rd, 2011. When, when was the date on this one? I forgot. Well, we'll check on the way back up. Don't know if these are all in order. So, PNC Plaintiff versus whomever. I hereby enter an appearance of PNC Bank National Successor by Merger, National Bank Successor by Merger, as a defendant in the above entitled cause and counsel as attorney therein. If I, you know, what is this? This is October 3rd, 2011. In the Circuit Court for the County of Cook, Illinois County, County Department. This is in the County Department, not the General Chancery, the County Department of the Chancery Division. I hereby enter an appearance of PNC Bank. National Association, successor by merger to National City Bank, successor by merger to Mid American Bank as defendant in the entitled cause and counsel. So all these guys did is they put in an appearance. They they wrote an appearance piece of paper. Hey, we're here. You know, I don't know what that did, but it must have been necessary. And that was on uh, October third of two thousand eleven. We'll buzz up here real quick. Okay, that's 2012. So that happened way, way, way up here. Because these are all 2012, and that was October 3rd, 2011. Okay, so it was after this, but before this. And this is where they said uh, Rome was in default. And this is where there's an order of summary judgment against the bank. The bank getting a judgment against the bank. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to me, right? So, really, the first time I've had a chance to look at, uh, you know, the Chancery side paperwork, and, you know, looks like to me there's, it's got lots of holes. So, um, it is available, right? But, as you can see, it said there's affidavits that have been filed and so forth, and, you know, th this is them putting this paperwork in, <laughs> saying these things exist, well, you can subpoena the records then. I want to subpoena that affidavit you're talking about. Okay, well, we'll see what tomorrow brings. Uh, like I said, John uh, in New Hampshire's got a, a hearing at 9 o'clock in the morning tomorrow with a friend. And they put in a, uh, um, looking for an equitable remedy, had asked for a declaratory judgment. The judge says, well, I can't give you that, but I can give you a hearing. They put this in last week. They got a hearing today or tomorrow. 
and there was supposed to be a sale tomorrow and now the sale's been postponed and um, John said the clerks are very nice today and it's almost like he knows they know they you know whatever he's doing is the right thing to do and they seem to be very helpful and we don't know what that means we'll see what the judge says tomorrow but again we went through chancery into the civil side saying they didn't sign the deed of trust and the warranty deed is a uh, um, sales contract and we acknowledge it as the grantee and now we want to have it lawfully executed and we're asking for specific performance to have the whoever the court says but the closing agents basically to do their frickin job and lawfully execute the sales contract and give the title deed to the owner and since the deed of trust was never signed there is no contract give me back the securities you're not gonna sign the contract then give me back my securities I didn't mean it to be a gift it's not a unilateral contract it's a bilateral contract and we're gonna let a judge decide if that's the case in a court of equity not a court of law so alright good enough have a great night see ya bye